was able to see what nutrition can do for diabetes. So I like the title you guys gave it, Preventing and Improving Diabetes, Pre-Diabetes and Insulin Resistance. And I think that's, after today's presentation, you'll end up with the uh, idea in your head like, wow, the whole church should be here because so many people fall under the category of pre-diabetes and insulin resistance that don't know about it. You know what I mean? That they may have insulin resistance and pre-diabetes without knowing it, and it affects a large percentage of adults in our country. So first, the disclaimer, this is supposed, of course supposed to be a program for education, not a treatment. So anything we say here, you still have to consult with your doctor if you're going to make any changes to your lifestyle, as it should be, right? Uh, but let me just show you, this is Salud para la Gente in Watsonville, California. This is where I worked for several years as a clinical nutritionist, mostly with diabetics. Um, but we, I've been doing this kind of program for several years, too. This is the Watsonville Seventh-day Adventist Church. And my friend Tricia Kaiser there is a very just um, as dedicated to health as Sally and all of you here because she's a... A, she's a real trooper, and she's been doing this um, diabetes. We've been doing this diabetes program with her, with her, me and her, or her and I, I should say, more properly, uh, for about six or seven years. We used to do it twice a year until I said, Trisha, I'm sorry, but I can't do it twice a year. I'm too busy. So we've been doing it once a year in the fall, and we do a five sessions, plus she adds one because she loves this presentation from Dr. Neil Barnard. And there's the video, and so she puts the video on as a reinforcement in some of the concepts that we go through in this five-session program. Uh, so, and every time she does it, magically, I don't know what she does, but she gets people to show up. I mean, she's just, I don't know, she's just this person that I admire a lot. Anyway, also, uh, here's Dr. Um, Milton Teske, I don't know how many of you guys know him. He is an Adventist. He works at the Hanford Hospital. I'm not sure if it's an Adventist hospital or not, but I know he works in Hanford. And he is a physician. And here in this picture, we are in Honduras. And in Honduras, we did a six-day reverse, uh, reversing diabetes program for the little town. This is in the middle of nowhere, literally, in rural Honduras, where I thought, there's no way you're going to get people with diabetes here. People eat probably all healthy food. They grow their own. Well, that was shattered in about, you know, 30 minutes after we got there because it's not at all like that. In fact, in the little town with no traffic lights, no paved roads or anything, you still go to the little corner store and there's the junk food. So even in the middle of rural Honduras and in Central America, people have high cholesterol, diabetes, and you know all the different diseases we see here as well. And so he did the medical presentations, which I translated and I did some nutrition presentations. And here you have the nice people of the town stretching. We had some people, some uh, phys physical therapists actually doing the, the exercise for people who had an exercise for decades, probably. In fact, this lady you see in the front, I don't know if I can point, I don't know that you can see, but the lady, the very, the first lady right there, she's 71 years old and, um, uh, and, and they're exercising and everything. I'm like, what about your husband? Why don't you bring your husband? And she's like, oh, he's healthy. I'm like, really? Oh, yeah. And then she starts telling me all about how most people in the town here, it's a little valley, so it's surrounded by mountains. Most people have uh, some land in the mountains where they grow crops. And so she said that when they first got married, like 50 years before this picture was taken, both of them would go up the mountains. It would take them two hours to climb up to where their land was, and they would, you know, of course, tend to their crops and then come down every day. And then she's like, well, I started having babies, and then I had some varicose veins, and I, didn't, I stopped going up the mountain like 30 years ago. But my husband still goes up every day. And, I'm, and she goes, he's so skinny, you should see him. I'm like, well, guess what? 
He's exercising every day. That's probably the difference here. You know, you have diabetes, high cholesterol, all these diseases. He doesn't. Maybe because of the exercise, you know what I mean? So it was interesting. Uh, we gave them, of course, very different foods than what they were used to. In fact, here is the other nutritionist that went with us to this trip, and she got to do the recipes, and she's like, oh, can you, when, before the trip, you know, she's from the Fresno Church, and she's like, oh, can you bring some recipe books because I have to do the, the cooking classes. I'm like, sure. I took a bunch of recipe books. None of them work there because this is a little town, an hour and a half from the capital city. There were no stores there. There were no safe ways. For reals. And not only that, the first year I went, because I've been there five times now, but the first year we went, there was not even electricity on the campus. They had no refrigerators. They stored everything in a dark room, and that's where they had their vegetables. So there's like no ingredients here for us to do our little, you know, uh, recipes for my cookbook or whatever. None of that worked. So we had to like, okay, let's go see what they have. And that's basically what she did. She's like, okay, they have beans, they have corn, they have brown rice that they go get at the Capitol once a month. They bring brown rice. They have lots of vegetables and work, work from that, you know? So you can, so there's a myth that eating healthy is more expensive and difficult. That's not necessarily true. If you rely on basic foods, like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, it does not have to be expensive or difficult. You don't have to use any fancy recipes at all because she somehow figured out how to make things from scratch. No recipe whatsoever, and it turned out well. FYI, just wanted to let you know that. Okay, so let's talk about diabetes because I always start with the question, what is diabetes? And I ask people, what is diabetes? And people are like, well, lots of sugar in the blood. Yes, lots of sugar in the blood, that's correct. Uh, your pancreas doesn't work anymore, no insulin. Well, that depends. It depends on the type of diabetes you have. So sometimes we have to kind of clarify what kind of diabetes are we talking about. So I don't know if you've heard, but there's actually several kinds of diabetes. As you probably heard of type 1 diabetes, it used to be called juvenile back in the day. That name is not, no longer used because nowadays children are also um, uh, diagnosed with type 2, which used to be called adult onset diabetes. So those names aren't used anymore because children nowadays are getting sick with type 2. So type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. I don't know if you've heard, but it, uh, is an autoimmune disease is when your own immune system attacks part of your body. In this case, it is the beta cells in your pancreas that produce insulin. It usually happens at a young age. And so you're no longer producing insulin, therefore you have to get it, you know, every day. And that's what happens with type 1. But let me tell you that a lot of people with type 1 diabetes benefit from a program like this, a lifestyle program, because some of them also develop something we're going to talk about today mostly, which is called insulin resistance. So they have the type 1, which is the autoimmune, but they also have insulin resistance on top. So that's why they end up using higher and higher amounts of insulin as time goes by. And so they can benefit from a lifestyle program, reduce their insulin resistance, and reduce the amount of insulin they need every day to what we call the physiological amount, which is just what your body requires, what your pancreas would make otherwise, and no more than that. And so that's also very helpful. It helps to um, prevent complications of diabetes. Of course, the, um, uh, oh, here's a, a, a graphic that I wanted to show you how your insulin producing cells, if you see the picture on the right there, those are destroyed. And that's what happens with type 1, unfortunately. Now, let me tell you something else, by the way, is that they have found that children who are introduced to cow milk at a young age are at a higher risk for type 1 diabetes. I don't know if you knew that. But that's one of the risk factors for type 1 is an early introduction to cow, protein, cow milk proteins, which can and sometimes trigger this autoimmune uh, response. So that's type 1. But the most common type of diabetes is type 
to, like I said, it used to be called adult onset diabetes. It usually happened after 40, 45 years old. No longer true. I've seen kids, myself, with my own eyes, 10, 12 years old, already with diabetes, type 2, taking medications as if they were adults. It's so sad. It's really, really heartbreaking when you see children with adult, adult diseases today. That's a very, that's something, to, you know, I don't have time to talk about it, but it's, it's so heartbreaking. So that's type 2. That's 90 to 90% 90 of people who have diabetes are type 2. So most people who have diabetes have type 2. Um, so we won't talk too much about the other types just because they're a smaller amount of uh, people or a smaller percentage of the population. There's also gestational diabetes, by the way. I also treated a lot of ladies with diabetes while they were pregnant, which has a lot to do with, of course, hormone changes, but there's also an underlying insulin resistance there. And it goes away when you have the baby, but this is important for young women or women in, um, to know, and that could still have babies, that 50% of women who have had gestational diabetes then go on to develop type 2 diabetes. That's a high percentage, 50% of women. So they really should know uh, more lifestyle, uh, their, you know, um, things that they should learn about so that they can avoid just uh, type 2 diabetes. And I don't know if you've heard about this one. This I only heard about maybe a couple years ago. And it's type 1.5. Has anybody ever heard of 1.5? So it's latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. So LADA, L-A-D-A, type 1.5 diabetes. And it basically has the... Um, uh, some of the things in common with type 1, so some characteristics of type 1 and some characteristics of type 2. So type 1, it also has that autoimmune component, so it is an autoimmune diabetes, but it happens later in life. So it's like type 2 in that sense. And it's also slower onset. Type 1 usually is it's rapid onset, so it happens quickly and it child or, or young person needs to start using insulin quickly after diagnosis, whereas type 1.5 usually takes longer to get to that point. So in sometimes it could almost be arrested or slowed down almost because the autoimmune um, part of it or autoimmune reaction is a slower reaction. So sometimes you can almost slow it down or, or, or halt it. So a lot of people are misdiagnosed with type 2 that actually have 1.5, and even if they try all the uh, lifestyle changes, sometimes cannot get to the point where they can completely um, get rid of their diabetes, and it's probably because they need some insulin because they probably have some autoimmune uh, destruction of their beta cells. So it's good to know that. Okay, last but not least, I don't know if you've ever heard of type 3 diabetes. Anybody's ever heard type 3? <laughs> I knew I would surprise some of you. Uh, type 3 diabetes, if you Google it, you'll get a name of another disease that is very common, actually. It's a type of dementia. It starts with the letter A. Alzheimer's disease. So you just go ahead and Google that. You might come across some actual literature, scientific literature, like this one. Um, says diabetes, Alzheimer's disease is, a, is type 3. Three diabetes, uh, diabetes evidence reviewed, and basically what this is saying here is that people who have insulin resistance tend to have insulin resistance in the brain as well, which then leads to damage in the brain long term, which can lead to dementia and onset of Alzheimer's disease. Did anybody know that? Well, now you do. So there's several types of diabetes. You see that. So it's important to know because some of these have the same root causes. So like I mentioned before, type 1 people can also have some insulin resistance. Type 2 for sure. Type 1.5 can have insulin resistance. Gestational diabetes people can have some insulin resistance in type 3. So they all kind of have this component, which is the root cause of diabetes, which is what I really, really, really want to discuss today. What is the root cause of type 2 diabetes that other diabetes types also share? So here we have a very 
simple representation of a glucose molecule. As you know, if you had lunch, anybody had lunch today? You probably had lunch and breakfast, maybe, hopefully. And you probably had maybe, I don't know, some, could have had some cereal or some oats or some fruit, maybe. For lunch, you might have, I don't know, a sandwich or some potatoes or rice, veggies. All those things, or legumes, you could have had beans maybe, or lentils, all those things that I've just mentioned, all those foods have something in common. And they have carbohydrates, which is a nutrient that provides energy. A lot of people get this wrong idea with carbohydrates, like, ooh, carbs are bad, right? Carbs are so bad, they are the enemy. But that's not true because most foods that we eat have some carbohydrates, unless they're pure protein or pure fat. But otherwise, they have some carbohydrates. And some people don't really distinguish between different kinds. There's healthy carbohydrates, and there's very unhealthy carbohydrates. You can't compare a Coke and an apple. They both have carbohydrates, but they're very different foods, you see, different types of carbohydrates. But anyway, all carbohydrates are digested and turn into a simple sugar called glucose, which is the main, this is very important, is the main fuel of your cells. You need glucose. Without it, you would probably die. Just like a type 1 diabetic, if it don't get insulin, not enough glucose goes into their cells, they could die. So we need the glucose. Now, the thing is, the glucose has to go inside the cell to, in order to provide that fuel to feed your cell. They have to go, these molecules have to go inside the cell. But the cell has something called a membrane. Do you see that little line around it? Of course, it's a very simple representation. Cells are much more complex. But what you see around the cell is a membrane. How is that glucose supposed to penetrate the membrane? It doesn't do it automatically. It doesn't do it so easily. It needs to somehow go through a passageway, which in this case we will illustrate very simply as just a door <laughs> because it's easy that way, right? So you can picture this entryway as a door that the cell has on its surface that somehow has to open though because you can't go through a closed door. So somehow the glucose has to get through that door too. It's closed by default. So how does the door open? Here comes a little helper. That little hormone you guys know all about called insulin. So basically the job of the insulin is to open the door, grab the glucose, put it inside. That's it. And that's how you get fed, how your cells get fed. But there's a tiny little problem. Sometimes we have this thing called the SAD diet. You know what the SAD diet is? Standard American diet. And we also have a not so active lifestyle. And sometimes we, that part of that standard American diet could be a lot of calories and a lot of fat. All of those things combine to cause something. If you, look, if you look up the, the following term that I'm going to give you, you will see what I mean. The term is intramyocellular, ooh, that sounds already super complicated, intramyocellular lipid. Whoo, what in the world is that? Intramyocellular lipid. You, wanna, you want me to tell you what it is? It's simply fat. Fat that accumulates inside the cells. Why? Because we consume too much energy in our sad diet, and we don't burn enough in our very sedentary lifestyle. So there we start accumulating fat. And that fat starts accumulating inside the cell as well, not just in your fat tissue, but also inside your cells. Now, the other thing is you can be actually a skinny person but you might consume too much fat in your diet. Have you ever seen those people? They seem to be able to eat all the burgers, all the pizza in the world, and they don't gain a pound. Have you seen people like that? I have. Well, they might be also accumulating extra fat in their cells just because their high fat diet also translate, translates into intramyocellular lipids. Do you see that? So here's a, 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 a several factors that combine 
to uh, end up in that accumulation. So excessive fat in the body, excessive fat in the diet, and lack of burning that fat. Because if I were to run a marathon a day, I would probably not have that much fat in my cells. You see what I'm saying? Even if I ate 5,000 calories a day. So there's a combination of factors that leads to the accumulation of fat inside the cell, which unfortunately, as you could see from this graphic, actually interferes with those doors, those glucose receptors, which are the doors that I was talking about. It's like once the, the insulin, it fits like a key. So sometimes you'll see it illustrated as a key. Insulin fits in that receptor as a key. But it's, what's supposed to happen is once it fits there as a key, it's supposed to cause a chain reaction that opens the door. But when the fat is there, insulin comes, it fits, but it doesn't open the doors. So if the doors stay closed, what happens to the glucose? It cannot go inside, so where does it stay? Well, it stays, it stays outside, which means in your blood. So you go in the morning, you get a glucometer, you take one little drop of blood, you put it in the little strip, and the glucometer says, oops, 150 fasting. Oh, oh, oh. That's too much. Why? Why is it so high? Because the glucose is not going inside your cells. Why is it not going inside your cells? Because there's something called intramyocellular lipids, fat that's interfering with what's supposed to happen naturally, which is that the, your, your insulin is supposed to open that door, let the glucose in. That's not happening. But I th want you to notice that I mentioned fat. And additional calories can translate into fat wherever they come from. So if I drink, you know, two liters or four liters of Coca-Cola every day, let's say I drink a gallon of Coke every day, that's a lot of sugar and that's a lot of calories. But in what I want to really emphasize here is that it's not the sugar that's causing this problem. The sugar can translate into fat and the fat can interfere with the process of the glucose going inside the cell. But it's the fat. And that fat can be in your body through being overweight or obese, or it can be in your diet. You can be skinny. You can eat very low sugar, but eat too much fat. And that will still get you here. You see what I'm saying? The reason why I'm saying this is because nowadays the most popular diet out there to lose weight, even control diabetes, is called the keto. Have you ever heard of it? The keto diet. Everybody's doing the keto diet. I have a video in Spanish, and my, my Spanish channel has gone like super viral ever since the COVID-19 pandemic started because I put out a video there on how, in fact, it was for diabetics. If you have diabetes, things you can do to improve your immunity. And I put it out there in February of 2020, when I wasn't even like really big yet, but it was starting. And I put that video out there, it got like 100,000, I don't even know how many views. So I started putting more stuff, and then the channel went viral. But I put a video the other day, and I titled the video, Why the Keto Diet is the Worst Diet for Diabetes. I get so many negative comments, let me tell you. I get so many, so many hate, hating comments. People hate that because some people are really attached to their keto diet. But let me tell you why I think the keto diet is the worst diet for diabetes. As long as you're not eating any carbohydrates, you're not going to have any glucose, any of these blue things in your blood because you're eating so little of it. Okay? So that's why your glucose levels are artificially low. But you eat, a, if you, especially if you do this keto diet for several months, and you eat an apple or a piece of bread, your blood sugar is going to shoot up. Why? Because a keto diet is a high-fat diet. Did you know this? It's not a high-protein diet. It's a high-fat diet. 60, 70, or more sometimes percent fat. That's very high. 
So you're consuming all this fat that is actually making you more insulin resistance. It's putting a lot of lipids right inside your cells. So now you eat any carbs and you're very carb intolerant. Your body cannot process those carbs. So now you're stuck. You have to eat no carbs. You have to continue eating this keto diet or else. Of course, you could reverse it. And we'll talk about that. But that's why I think keto diet is the worst diet for, di for diabetics. Because it actually worsens their underlying condition, which is the insulin resistance. This is what we're seeing right here. This is called insulin resistance. The insulin is there. You see, the insulin is there. It just can't open that door. It's trying. In fact, here comes little helper, the pancreas. Pancreas is like, there's something wrong here. There's way too much glucose in the blood. Of course, the blood goes through the pancreas just as much as any other organ. So the pancreas detects too much sugar in the blood. And so the pancreas is like, what the heck is going on? I'm going to have to do something. And what does the pancreas do? What can it do? It can, that's the only thing it can do. It makes more insulin. Of course, the insulin here in this graphic is illustrated by the little man, right? So the poor insulin here comes more insulin. But the thing is, was the problem, the lack of insulin, that wasn't really the problem. The problem is that insulin can't open the door. Now, to some extent, especially at the beginning of this process, you can actually kind of force the glucose in by producing more insulin. So sometimes your pancreas starts producing twice or three times as much insulin as it's supposed to, and you kind of force that glucose in. So then you check your glucose in the morning. It's normal. But it's not normal. In other words, something is not right. You're making way too much insulin. You have insulin resistance. But you check your blood, and what happens? It's normal. You go to the doctor, the doctor will say, congratulations, you have no prediabetes or diabetes. You're in good shape. Keep going. But wait a minute. Inside your body, if you were able to see what's going on, something is not quite right. You're making too much insulin. Your blood sugars are artificially low, if you want to say it that way, because something is not right. Something is not metabolically right inside your body. In other words, this is the main point I want to make. When your pancreas is forced to work extra, you may have normal sugar, but you still have insulin resistance. Huh. That's kind of what I wanted to illustrate. So. All that fat is, again, blocking, but sometimes your pancreas is working extra, so you can't tell there's anything wrong. Well, you can maybe. You could actually have your insulin tested. How much insulin I, do I have in my blood? You can have hyperinsulinemia, too much insulin. That's a clue. That's a clue. Why do you have too much insulin? Because your pancreas is making too much. So another way to illustrate it is from this table that comes directly, there's the source. The source is a book called Goodbye Diabetes from Dr. Wes Youngberg, whom I've had the pleasure to meet a couple of times from Loma Linda. He was in Guam for years. If you've, if you've read the book, he was in Guam for a few years. And because Guam, by the way, if it was an independent country, because it's like a territory like Puerto Rico, but if it was an independent country, it would probably have one of the highest rates of diabetes in the world. So much diabetes in Guam. So he was called to help out. You know, let's bring down diabetes in Guam. And he was there for a few years. And he was able to see that some people who have no diabetes yet, who have no pre-diabetes yet, but have blood sugar higher than what's optimal. Do you see the first column? Well, the second column says optimal blood sugar. That's your optimal. If everything is working good, you take out your, your, your glucose in the morning, you check your glucose in the morning, and it's going to be between 70 and 84, give or take. That's optimal. 
So, if you have a little bit higher, but not quite in the pre-diabetes, do you see pre-diabetes starts at 100? Fasting sugar, 100. So if you have 101, okay, you're pre-diabetic. Your doctor will probably tell you that. If you have 126 or more, you're diabetic. You probably will tell you, your doctor will tell you that. But if your blood sugar in the morning fasting is 90, like I said, your doctor will give you some congratulations and send you home. But according to this table, it's higher than optimal. Why? You might have some insulin resistance, which, if not changed, if something is not done, will lead to the next thing, prediabetes. And what comes after prediabetes? Diabetes. Do you see how it's all part of the same process? It's all part of the same process. Now, this could take decades. So you're da-da-da, everything is okay. I have no prediabetes. I must be doing really well with my diet. But maybe you're not. Maybe your pancreas is working super hard, keeping your blood sugar down, but you are insulin resistant. And someday your pancreas will be like, I'm too tired. I'm not going to make anymore. And all of a sudden, boom, you go to the doctor. It's like, whoa, what happened to you? You have diabetes. Why? I've been doing so well. You see how this works? It's a process. It's not like you wake up with diabetes one day. That's not how it works. It takes several years of insulin resistance. Now, the same table was actually expanded into something bigger here. And what you can see is that they've expanded the diabetes numbers. But I also like it that it has the A1C because many people check their A1C now. So if you have A1C 5.0 to 5.3, you're probably good. But above 5.4 up to 5.7, which is where you are diagnosed with prediabetes. So between 5.4 and 5.7, that's above optimal. It's not prediabetes yet, but it's above optimal. So why is that? So it's maybe good to start checking, right, what's going on there. The thing about it is, like Dr. Youngberg realized, is that some people in that range before prediabetes but above normal or above optimal, I should say, some of those people, this is what happened. This is how he realized this was the problem. Some of those people started getting complications of high blood sugar before they were even diagnosed with prediabetes or diabetes. They started getting some of the complications that sometimes are associated with diabetes, but they didn't have diabetes. They didn't even have prediabetes. So what are those complications? Well, here's some of the things that happen when you have insulin resistance, whether or not you have diabetes. These are just associated with insulin resistance. Number one, causes high blood pressure. There's a metabolic disorder that's going on here. And so some, some people have these things together. High blood pressure, um, low HDL, high LDL, triglycerides that are too high, dyslipidemia. In other words, your lipids are all over the place. High blood pressure. High lipids, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome. You see why? Because these things tend to happen together because something is going on. Your metabolism is not working properly. Also could cause up and down. Sometimes you get hypoglycemia because of the insulin resistance. So your pancreas is working so hard that sometimes your blood sugars go whoosh, way down. And that's why you get hypoglycemia. You see what I'm saying? But there's more. It puts you at a high risk for heart attacks. It puts you at a high risk for stroke. Oh, and there's Alzheimer's. We already said that. It's diabetes type 3. Cancer. Breast cancer in women is much correlated with insulin resistance. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong before you're even diagnosed as pre-diabetic, let alone diabetic. There's a high percentage of people who are pre-diabetic and don't know it. But a much, much, much more higher percentage of people have insulin resistance and don't know it. And it's all connected. 
That's why I think it's so important to talk about what is the root cause. Even back in the 1920s, this doctor, Dr. Shirley Sweeney, back in the late 20s, almost 100 years ago, was able to determine the difference between eating a high carbohydrate meal and a high fat meal and what it does to your blood sugar. The C represents carbohydrate. That's a high carbohydrate meal. The F is a high fat meal. Which one affects your blood sugar more? Easy, easy to tell. It's the high fat meal. You see? Because it makes you insulin resistant. But people think that eating their burger is fine because it doesn't have any sugar. You see what I'm saying? Because it doesn't have any sugar. But it's actually causing that insulin resistance. It's actually causing your blood sugar to go up right after you eat. You see what I'm saying? Now, in the 50s, they also did something similar. Here we see seven different diets. The only things that vary between the diets are the carbohydrates and the fat amount. So they go from a number one is a low carb, high fat, to all the way down to seven, which is a high carb, low fat. Proteins are kept the same, calories are kept the same, and on the left side of the graphic, you can see that the darker the red, which means the more fat, the more insulin resistant you become. The higher your blood sugar is the fat that's pushing your sugar to go higher. Now, once you are diabetic, you become carbon tolerant. So, of course, eating sugar will go will make your blood sugar go up. But these are healthy people. In healthy people, carbohydrates don't elevate the blood sugar. It's the fat. You see what I'm, do you see the difference? It's very important to understand this because unfortunately, it's not common knowledge. It should be, but it's not. Even though the, um, the, the, the literature is there, the studies are there. But it's not common knowledge because a lot of people don't like to hear this. <laughs> they don't want to cut the fat out. They don't want to cut their meat or, you know, cheese or all these yummy things. They don't, they don't want to be told not to eat that. You see what I'm saying? So insulin resistance, again, comes from two major reasons. Number one, either consume a high-fat diet or have excess fat in the body. Both of them produce the same thing. And the number two reason is not burning that excess fat because they're not athletes. They're consuming three, 4,000 calories a day as if they were athletes, but they're not. Therefore, they're actually producing that insulin resistance. Now, let me give you just really quick some of the um, statistics on pre-diabetes. Pre-diabetes, not diabetes, pre-diabetes. Half of adults, 40, 40 to 59, have prediabetes. Half of adults, the ages of 40 to 59, have prediabetes. Whether they know it or not, most of them don't. After the age of 60, it's two-thirds of adults have prediabetes. After the age of 74, it's three-fourths. Most people have prediabetes if they're older than 50, 40. And a lot of other people have insulin resistance and also don't know it. Now, with diabetes, you can see here from the statistics that tell us the International Diabetes Federation kind of gives a statistic, a projection of how many people will get diabetes right now. About 463 million people in the world have it. By 2045, it'll be like 700 million. So it's growing. It's a pandemic. It's really a pandemic. We don't talk about it in those terms, but it is. The saddest thing for me is this. One out of, two, one out of three children in the United States will be diabetic. These are the kids that have been born after the year 2000. One out of three will be diabetic. That's in the general population. In the African-American, Hispanic population is half of them. Half of the children today will be diabetic, whether they are diagnosed at the age of 15 or 50, they will get it, unless something is done now to change it. And I don't see an urgency, unfortunately. I think it's urgent 
I think it is. So again, what are the risk factors? Carrying too much energy in your body in the form of, of course, over, overweight or obesity. That is one of the major risk factors for diabetes, prediabetes, and insulin resistance. Number two, oh, by the way, I just wanted to show you this graphic that shows you that you can be a skinny fat person. Skinny fat in the sense that you see that the lady here in the, on the right has lost weight from the beginning. The middle image there is an overweight person. You can lose weight healthy or unhealthy way. The unhealthy way, you can end up with excess fat, whether or not your weight is normal. You can have absolutely normal BMI and still have excess fat. You can be obese inside and look normal. And that's what puts you at a higher risk. So it's not so much the weight, it's really the body composition that we really have to look into. So body composition. Now remember when we did that uh, clinic here? Some couple years ago, when was that? I don't remember. And they brought that, that uh, special scale that was so cool. And you got to grab the handles and it measured. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> I don't want to see that. It measures the, what's going on inside. It tells you the truth, Ugh, whether you like it or not. But basically what it measures is your body composition. Because you might be like the person on the right here and be a skinny fat person, or maybe you're healthy and you have enough muscle mass. And so we're gonna talk about that in the third presentation because that's when we talk about exercise, how to prevent that situation on the right, the excess fat and not enough muscle. But that's, anyway, that's the point is, it's the body composition that matters more than even weight. Second is of course the rich American diet, but actually it's the rich world diet because just about every country has imported our junk food and our multinational corporations are everywhere and selling their junk food everywhere. So everywhere, even in rural Honduras, you can buy junk food and a lot of it is from the US. <laughs> Some of them is produced lo locally, I have to say, but they just copy us because everybody wants the American lifestyle and unfortunately <laughs> it's pretty toxic. Okay, number three, of course, is lack of exercise, like we mentioned before. So our bodies are meant to move, um, and we don't move enough like our ancestors used to because our ancestors probably lived, I mean, I'm talking about a few hundred years ago, most of our ancestors lived in agricultural society where they had to grow the food, they had to, I mean, even to like cook your food, you had to cut wood, right? You didn't have that nice electric, you know, saw. No, you didn't have that. You had to cut it. Women had to wash their clothes. You know, so much more activity back then that we have eliminated. Now, I hear a lot of people say, well, but you know what? I have diabetes because my mom is diabetic and my dad and my uncle, all my family. So I inherited the diabetes. Like, I got it. I didn't, like, do anything wrong. You know what I mean? So how true is that? Can you actually get the diabetes from your parents? What do you think? So yeah, so if you inherit the diet and lifestyle, it's possible. But I have to say, there is a genetic component, so some people may be predisposed to diabetes. So my dad, for instance, had diabetes. I could potentially have a predisposition. But does that mean that I'm going to get diabetes? No. Because lifestyle is a much bigger factor than even genetics. And this could be illustrated with the next uh, risk factor, which is ethnic origin, which is, of course, very much related to genetics. And the reason why I think this is illustrative is because do you know which group in the US has the highest rate of diabetes in the United States? If you've heard this presentation before, you probably remember. Who? Actually, it's not Hispanics. There's actually a Native American group that has the highest rate of diagnosed diabetes in the United States, and it's the Pima Indians that live mostly in the Arizona region of the United States. Highest diabetes in the country. Well, but the story is interesting because they act, actually, if you read the story of the Pima Indians, they used to be a large group. I mean, I'm talking about several hundred years ago, five to 700 years ago. They were a larger group. They split and some of them went south, and some of them settled in the north, which is now Arizona. But some of them went south and settled where? 
what's south of the United States? Mexico. So they went south, they went to Mexico, and so there's actually a group of native people in the north part of Mexico, in the mountains, that are very genetically close to the Pima Indians in the United States. They're like first cousins. And you know what they are? Do you know what group I'm talking about? They call the Tarahumara Indians. They live in northern Mexico. They're actually quite famous because they're, they run. They're runners. They do high or very long distance running, like 100 mile races. And they always finish in the first 10. Even the women are runners. I mean, they're just amazing, amazing, amazing people. Well, but the point is the following. The Tarahumara Indians, being very closely uh, related to their cousins in the north, do you think they have one of the highest diabetes rates in Mexico? No. They have some of the lowest diabetes rates in the world. Of course, they're very humble people. They live in the mountains. They have very low income. They're not eating burgers every day or drinking Coca-Cola. They eat very simple food. They can grow corn, beans, vegetables, chia seeds. They're known for their chia seeds. That's what they eat. And they run a lot, so they're very active. And they have some of the lowest diabetes rates in the world. So the point I'm trying to make is that the genetics did not determine their diabetes rates, obviously. Okay. I just want to mention a few more things. What are the complications of diabetes, prediabetes, and insulin resistance? We kind of talked about it already, but I just want to general, just say in a very general sense that diabetes ages your body. It ages your body very fast. All this blood sugar is circulating all over the place. It's damaging tissues everywhere. Of course, some of the highest uh, risks for diabetes is in the cardiovascular system. So if you're pre-diabetic, your risk of a heart attack goes up by 50% if you're pre-diabetic. If you're diabetic, your risk of a heart attack goes up to 400%. And, of course, also you have a higher risk for stroke. And basically, 70% of adults with type 2 diabetes will have one of those two as their cause of death. More than 70% of adult with diabetes type 2 will die of one of those two things. And, of course, as you probably know, uh, a stroke is basically the same thing that happens in the heart. It's just happening in the brain, right? So it's the same underlying condition. I have this twice. But the other major thing that could happen is, of course, renal disease. And as you probably know, one of the main reasons why people end up with dialysis is diabetes. So it's very unfortunate because once you get to that stage, it's almost um, very, very hard to reverse renal failure. Although, uh, I actually don't know if I have it in, in this lecture, but I probably have it in a future lecture, a plant-based diet can do wonders to renal function. So I've seen a study where you could see the people were going down, the renal function, the graph was just going down, 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 down until they got switched to a vegan diet, and the renal function, instead of going like this down, it went like this. It stopped deteriorating, and then some people even went up. So that's pretty amazing. So that's good to know. Of course, also blindness is one of the main causes of adult blindness is diabetes as well. When I worked at Salud Para La Gente, the optometrist there would see people that didn't know they had any blood sugar issues, but she would look at their eyes. They were having eye problems, and she would just diagnose them, based, not really diagnose them, but kind of say, you know what? I could, she could tell the type of damage in the retina. So she would say, you should go check with your doctor. Go check your blood sugars. And sure enough, they would end up with me because they were diabetic, but they didn't know until they got their eyes checked. And I, once I met a lady, one, a lady from the Watsonville Church, Spanish church, says, can you come and visit my neighbor? And we went to visit her neighbor, 40-year-old woman with children, with grandchildren in her house. I don't know how she cooked. I don't know how she cleaned the house. 
She was completely blind, well, almost completely blind. She saw shades. And she could see that there were people there because we were sitting against the window. So she could see kind of like there were people there, shapes. 40 years old. Whoops. Shh, quiet. My, my phone, my watch is talking to me. Okay, of course, the other major problem is a weakened immune system. So that's why I created that video that I told you went viral because I'm like, oh, diabetics are really in a lot of trouble here. And sure enough, we ended up finding out later that that's one of the underlying reasons for a very serious COVID infection. It's because they have weakened immune system. All that sugar circulating everywhere in your body, I don't know if you know, but if you drink a Coke, you can actually measure your immunity going down. Did you know? Some of the cells in your immune system stop working. And that actually lasts for about five hours. If you don't eat any more sugar, it will come back to normal. But with diabetics, that's the situation all the time. Their blood sugar is high all the time. So their immunity is almost permanently lower. So you get infections. One, one time I had a lady in the clinic who said she had this like, this like, like a, I don't know, like a, a, a bug bite or something that she scratched. She ended up with a sore in, on, her, on her leg. She had a sore, an open sore in her leg. And she ended up having to go to Mexico for some reason. For two months, she was already planning to go to Mexico for two, reason, for two months. So she didn't go to the doctor. She covered it with a bandage. She didn't do anything. She just went to Mexico. She didn't take off the bandage for two months, which is, for me was like, what? Why'd you do that? Well, she just left it on for two months. She didn't go to the doctor there because she didn't have insurance, whatever. So she waited until she came back to the United States. And she said to me, when the doctor finally took out the bandage, the skin was green. <laughs> I mean, you can't imagine. It's just gross. But what's happening there is that the skin is getting an infection that is not healing. Why is it not healing? Because your immunity is so low, your body doesn't heal properly. So people with diabetes get these colds that last for weeks, flu infections that last for weeks. They just don't respond the same per the way a person without diabetes does. So that's why you end up with gangrene sometimes, people with amputations. I have all kinds of stories to tell you. I'll tell you in, an, in another time. But research shows, this is the good news finally, research shows pre-diabetes is completely reversible completely reversible. And type 2 is reversible in most cases. And by most cases, I mean upwards of 85 to 90 percent of type 2 diabetics can possibly reverse their diabetes. It depends on the extent, of course, of the damage that's already been done, especially to the pancreas. But now people are like, People fight me on this all the time. So I put videos out there and people are like, oh no, uh, diabetes type two is a chronic disease. It's not curable. I'm like, okay, well, maybe you can argue with the ADA, the American Diabetes Association, because here's a consensus paper from the ADA. And basically look at the title. How do we define the, I didn't use the word cure. I always use reversal. Here, the ADA is saying, how do we define cure of diabetes? What? The ADA, American Diabetes Association, is saying we have to define how diabetes is cure because obviously they've seen enough people with type 2 diabetes being able to reverse it. Now, now they have to put a consensus paper so that professionals in the field know how to say to someone, okay, your diabetes is cured. And how do you say? Well, they put a, a table that basically has three definitions. You can have partial remission or complete remission or prolonged remission. And basically that means you have normal blood sugars for at least a year with no medication. So if your blood sugars were back to normal for a year without medication, the doctor can use this to declare you cured. Wow, that's good news, don't you think? I think it is, because one time I was given a, a class, this will happen many years ago, I was given a class at a clinic, and I always gave like, I did group classes with the diabetic patients, 
And one time, one of the lady doctors was like, oh, can I help you give the class? Oh, sure. I'm like, I want to do one of the classes. Okay. So she came to the first class. I did four sessions with them. She came to the first class. She wanted to do the medical part. I'm like, sure. Well, she gave an introduction, like a welcome, right? Like, oh, hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. And, and there was a group like this, maybe about 15 people. And she's like, you're all diabetics? And they're like, yes, we're all diabetics. And she's like, well, let me just tell you, diabetes is a chronic disease. You will have it for the rest of your lives. And they all nodded. And then she's like, and if you're not using insulin, you will. Because all diabetics use insulin at one point or another. You will end up with insulin someday. So I was like, what? I didn't say anything. I'm very respectful of doctors especially. But the next class where I was alone with them, I said, oh, I have good news for you. There's some research that says you can actually reverse it if you want. If you want, you have to make some changes, though. It's not automatic, and it's not necessarily easy. But it's not hard either if you really want to. So I really like to show this. I came across this paper not too long ago, but I really like to show it because some people are like not believing. Can you really cure diabetes? It's always been considered a chronic disease. But guess what? You could put it at least in remission, although the ADA is using the word cure. I didn't use it. They're the ones who are using it. But the point is, you could potentially reverse your condition, but that means you would have to reverse the underlying cause, which is insulin resistance. And that's the key right there. When we understand that that could be done, then we can unlock the key to reversing diabetes. And of course, we already know what that is, right? Remember the cell? Why did the insulin resistance come about? There was too much fat inside a cell. Now, let me tell you, over here in California, we're very fortunate to have Weimar Institute not too far from here. And you can actually go there and do their New Star program. It's not cheap, but it's excellent. If you want to spend 18 days being treated like royalty because basically they're going to feed you good food. They're going to put you in a nice little room. They're going to take you out for walks and they're going to give you lectures and all kinds of cool stuff. And you're going to learn a lot. And they have been doing this for over 30 years. They have statistics, luckily for us. And their statistics say the following. Of the people who come to the New Start program with diabetes, by the 18th day, which is the last day when they go home, 50% of diabetics are no longer taking medications and their glucose is back to normal. 50% in 18 days. Now, they have to go home. That's the hard part because now you're on your own. Now you have to eat the healthy food by yourself. You have to take yourself for walks. You see, that could be hard. Not everybody follows it, but the ones who do, who persist for 90 days, they do the follow-up, they call them up, hey, how's your diabetes? They've done the follow-up and they have the statistics. By 90 days, ab above 90% of the patients who started out with diabetes now no longer have it. In other words, they put it in remission, no medications and normal blood glucose levels, above 90%. But it's not 100%. Some of them might have permanent damage in their pancreas and they might need some insulin and they might not be able to get away without any insulin at all. But for most people, it is reversible. Now, we also have, you might not have thousands of dollars to go to Weimar, but maybe you can read a book for $15 or $10 or whatever on Amazon, right? Really cheap. You buy it, you read it. Dr. Neil Barnard has done research. He's taking groups of patients, put them on the ADA diet, the ADA diet, by the way, is a great improvement from the junk food diet. So the ADA, ADA diet, you're going to count your carbs, lower your fat, do all kinds of good things. Great. Much better than pizza and burgers, for sure. But he took that diet and compared it to a plant-based diet, which we'll talk about next time. And next time I'll tell you the results. But basically, the 
plant-based diet. One, people were able to get off medications and lower their blood glucose. Or here's another book, The 30-Day Diabetes Miracle, excellent book by the people at the Lifestyle Center of America, which had a very similar program with, you know, plant-based diet, lifestyle, etc. My favorite is The End of Diabetes by Dr. Jill Furman, excellent book, really good source of information, all of it, you know, with the references and everything. There's no books in Spanish, so I wrote one. This is my book for reversing diabetes in Spanish because there wasn't any and somebody had to write it. But so many people ask, well, how come my doctor doesn't tell me this? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you my opinion of why your doctor might not tell you this. It's not their fault. They're trying to do their best. But the thing is, doctors are busy and doctors are not always up to speed with the latest research. And there's several reasons, okay? So why isn't this more widely known? Number one, scientific research trickles down slowly. So here's the very, you know, high-end PhD people doing the university research. Those people are not talking to the patients. So they publish research that doctors have to read. They don't always read it. It takes time, okay? So it takes time to trickle down to medical practice. But many doctors think also that you wouldn't do it. It's much easier to give you a prescription medication, send you home. Whereas if they start telling you, well, you need to start exercising more, and people are like, ah, <laughs> right? Do what now? And stop eating so many burgers. Ah, oh, you know, people don't want to hear that. They want to be given the pill and continue eating their bad diet and not exercising. But I have to say, doctors don't have the time to do what I just did. This took an hour and some minutes. They don't have that kind of time. I'll tell you what, I worked in a clinic. Those, pe those were doctors. They were under pressure to see at least 20 patients a day, some of them 25. You have 10 minutes, 15 at best. How are you going to explain all of this and motivate someone? It's hard. It's difficult. I feel for them. I feel bad for them. Uh, and uh, the other bad thing is medical journals sometimes are actually dominated by the pharmaceuticals. So the highlight articles are going to be the pharmaceutical articles. So the, you know, the, the medications that bring down glucose. Oh, here's a nutritional article. Ah, that's, let's put that in another journal nobody reads. You see what I'm saying? That's what happens. So the main journals that doctors are reading might not even have the nutrition research. That might be in a different journal that they might not read or know about. So these, all of these things combine to unfortunately cause the situation we have nowadays, which is that most doctors, first of all, most doctors, at least 75% of doctors in this country go to medical school and don't even have one nutrition class in four years of medical school. Not even one, not even to know the difference between proteins and carbohydrates, let alone how to reverse diabetes. So how are they, you know, they did a, actually a survey where they actually did like a, a bunch of questions on nutrition and they asked two groups of people. One group was MDs, they asked these questions, of diet, nutrition questions. And then people on the street, just regular, anybody on the street. Who rated higher, do you think? on just general nutrition knowledge. People on the street, because doctors don't get this in their education. And in fact, the education they get kind of is biased towards what they know, which is surgeries, medications, you know, and all that kind of procedures. That's what they do, procedures. And that's what they charge for. That's how they bill. That's, I mean, unfortunately, it's pervasive in this. Anyway, I don't want to talk about that anymore. I get too calm. <laughs> I get passionate about it. Next time, next session, we will talk about the diet for reversing diabetes. I think that's the main part. I think other parts are important, but the core of how to reverse diabetes has to do with food. And what food can we eat to reverse diabetes? So I just want to leave you with my website. It's healthfortoday.net. I do have some information there. I have some recipes even. And uh, yeah, so you can go in there and, and look around. I do have a, uh, some uh, social media pages 
that I occasionally, I've been more active in my Spanish social media just because there's not that many people out there giving this message in Spanish. In English, there's several people, several um, professionals doing this, and in Spanish, there's only a few. So I've been really active there. There's been a lot of demand, especially after COVID-19, because like I said, diabetes type 2, prediabetes, obesity, hypertension, all of these are underlying conditions that are known to be higher risk. In other words, if you have these conditions, you're at higher risk for a very bad infection with COVID-19. And in Latin America, COVID-19 was like really bad for many, 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 many months. Many months. So I had a lot of people ask me for information and I've been doing a lot of presentations on Zoom for very many months now. So I don't know if we still have time, maybe five to 10 minutes, if you guys want to ask any questions. Do you think we could do that? Okay, so I'm here if you want to comment or ask any questions, and if not, we'll finish. But any, yes. Ooh, that's a good one. I've been really researching that because someone asked me, can you make a video on fatty liver? Okay, I'll make a video on fatty liver. I started looking into it. And it's very interesting. There's three main reasons why we accumulate fat in the liver. So one of them has to do with excess adipose tissue in the body. So again, being overweight puts you at a higher risk for um, fat in the liver. So some of that fat basically moves into the liver. The other reason is dietary. So eating fat, again, so it's the same thing. See how it's all metabolically kind of related? So eating too much fat in the diet will translate into some of that fat settling in the liver, basically. And the other reason is called de novo lipogenesis, which means, basically means making fat out of nothing. Not out of nothing, but new fat. How do you make new fat? From sugar. Specifically, not just sucrose, which is regular white sugar or regular sugar, table sugar, but also more so than sucrose is high fructose corn syrup. Fructose, which is concentrated in high fructose corn syrup, is not used for energy like glucose. So glucose is used for energy like we saw. So most of the glucose you consume, even if you ate plain sugar, most of that sugar will be used for energy. Your body will use it. About 20% of that excess sugar might end up in your liver. But you take a Coke, most of that, sh all of that sugar is no longer sugar per se, it's fructose. It's not glucose per se, it's fructose. So you drink that Coke with high fructose corn syrup. All of that fructose is, goes into the liver. It's not used for energy like glucose is. All of it ends up in your liver. Your liver transforms the sugar into fat and stores it in the liver. So those are the three main ways we accumulate fat in the liver. And unfortunately, it is leading to severe disease in the liver for people who have never even had alcohol. You can end up with the same disease as with an alcoholic person who ends up with cirrhosis. You can end up with the same disease without ever drinking alcohol just from the accumulation of extra fat in the liver. So it can cause severe damage down the line. I know. It's pretty horrible if you think about it. But I saw children. Some children were being sent to me by their doctors, by the pediatricians, with fatty liver. 10, 12, 15-year-olds had fatty liver. I mean, this is horrible what's going on with our children. It's horrible. I really wish I could, like, draw more attention to this problem. The best way to bring down the fat in the liver is to bring down the fat in the diet and in the body. So losing weight is essential and eating a low-fat diet and eating a low-sugar diet. And I, by, I mean, I, by that, I mean a um, low refined sugar diet, especially fructose, high fructose corn syrup. So that's the best way that that fat will clear out. Um, you can do additional things. There's actually some herbs that help the liver quite a bit, like milk thistle, for instance. Artichokes are great for the liver. They're known to help to clean the liver. 
But that's additional to the main reason, the main thing, because the, the main cause for fatty liver is the accumulation of fat. So you have to remove the, the underlying cause of, of fatty liver. So, yeah, it's a problem. It's really a problem. It's an increasing problem, I think, in society. So it's very unfortunate to see kids, young people. I don't know how much longer it'll be until their liver fails. You know what I mean? Like, uh, we don't know. Some of these things with children, we don't know because these are diseases that used to be just in adults. For instance, several years ago, we knew that a person who's diagnosed with diabetes, adult, usually 45, 50, whatever, um, if you control your diabetes well, you can have 25 years of life. So that was more or less the life expectancy for adults with diabetes, well controlled. What about nowadays? How many years are, chil are children going to live? If you're diagnosed at the, the age of 12, do you get 25 or more? Like, who, we don't know. It's a new program. So it's a, it, we don't know yet the life expectancy of these kids born after the year 2000. Are they going to die at a young age, at 30, 40, 50? Uh, we don't know this. This is a new problem. It's unprecedented. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I'm 49. When I was growing up, I didn't have friends with diabetes type 2, or with high blood pressure, or with high cholesterol. You know what I mean? When I was in school, that was not a problem with kids. But today, it is. So you go to these public schools, and you, you take their blood pressure, a high percentage of those kids are going to have high blood pressure. And you measure the, the youngest kid I saw with my own eyes in my office with high cholesterol was this tall, a three-year-old boy with high cholesterol. I mean, what are we gonna do about these kids? I have no idea. I mean, that's why I do this, because I'm so passionate about it, because we need to talk to these parents, <laughs> you know, <laughs> change their minds. These kids are not are on their own, like they, it's not their fault, right? Like you can't blame a three-year-old for having bad cholesterol, you know what I mean? Like it's not that kid's fault. It's so sad, it's really, really sad, so. Anyway, sorry I ramble on. Let's <laughs> just get all passionate about this. Yes. I would. I think so. Yeah, I think so because it's working over time for so long, many decades sometimes. So eventually, it gives up. Yes. Yes, that is correct. That can happen. Her question. So she asked, is uh, pancreas exhaustion a thing? A pancreas fatigue a thing? And yes, it is. So after many years of producing, overproducing insulin, and it eventually does kind of, yeah, it quits. Yes, I think so. I think it also suffers from lipotoxicity, which is too much fat in the pancreas. So you can accumulate extra fat not only in the liver, and of course in your muscle cells, but also in your pancreas cells, and it's lipotoxicity that can also decrease pancreas output. No, not really, but it could, but a person could have type 1.5. So she, that a person could have an autoimmune reaction, and then it wouldn't be type 2 anymore. It would be 1.5. Yeah, but that could happen in adult age. So that's why we call it late on, like it's kind of late onset diabetes but it's an autoimmune diabetes so that could happen yes so good questions yes So the question is, are like lean proteins, good quality proteins? It depends on how you measure it. So if you're measuring just the quality of the protein itself by the amino acids presence, for instance, it would be considered high quality because it has all the different amino acids or whatever. So that's usually how protein quality was measured up until recently. Uh, and animal 
proteins were considered higher quality just because they had more of a variety of amino acids, right? Now we know that our body can actually store some of those amino acids, so we don't have to get them all from the same food. So basically, if I eat, you know, I don't know, uh, oats in the morning and beans for lunch, I could actually get all the amino acids I need, store them in a pool, and I don't need to eat them all in one food, like chicken or beef or whatever, animal protein. So, but in that sense, uh, animal protein was considered higher quality, I guess, if you could say. Nowadays, we know that, that you know, we don't have to have all the amino acids. But if you're going to have an animal protein, for sure you would want to have the leanest possible. So, for instance, like I said, the ADA diet, what do they do? They recommend you take the, the skin off of chicken uh, and avoid red meats because red meats are higher in saturated fat. Although, you know, to be fair, chicken does have saturated fat. It's not like it's fat-free. It does have fat in it, and it has cholesterol. Anything that comes from an animal will always have cholesterol unless it's been removed. So, like, uh, skim milk will have no cholesterol because all the fat has been removed. But otherwise, all of the animal proteins have some cholesterol in it. And, of course, cholesterol can put you at higher risk for heart, for heart disease. So, you know, you have to kind of weigh those, those risks. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to mention is that they have done studies with just giving people protein uh, concentrates. So the, either you concentrate animal protein, like whey or, or, or casein or some other animal protein, so protein concentrate without the fat, in, in vegetable protein. So, you know, like me, like a pea protein or brown rice protein. And when they've done that, they've noticed that people who consume the animal proteins, their cholesterol do go up. So it appears to be a result of just the protein without any of the fat. So it appears that animal protein can increase blood, glu uh, blood cholesterol, whereas the plant protein did not have, even the very concentrated type of plant protein did not have that effect. So, you know, so those are things that we have to take into consideration. If you cons but the, the good news is that most people who are in the, the blue zones, so the blue zones, of course, are the five regions with the highest longevity in the world. None of them were 100% vegan, but they were at least 90%. <laughs> so all of the blue zones consume a 90% plus um, plant-based diet. And so... The longest living people as a, as a population are the people in Okinawa, Japan. And they consume 98% plant-based. Of course, the centenarians, if you look back into their diet, they consume about 98% plant-based. Today's Okinawan young people have changed, unfortunately, their lifestyle. And they actually have high fat or high obesity rates, the young people in Okinawa. But the centenarians don't. They mostly keep the tradition and they eat a lot of plants. They eat, they eat some animal foods, but the amounts are very small, only about 2% of their diet. The longest living people in the world, not population, but just the longest subgroup, is Adventists who are vegetarian. I didn't even know this. But even people outside the church uh, in papers, you know, scientific papers, have mentioned that Vegetarian Adventists, and this is from Adventist Health Study 1 and 2, that have you know, studied the Adventists, especially in Loma Linda, but the, the second study was done in all of North America. And what they found is that they have the highest longevity. But they're not a group that is in one place. They're kind of scattered, <laughs> you know what I mean? But basically being an Adventist and vegetarian, usually Adventists who are vegetarian have five lifestyle practices. They don't drink, they don't smoke. They usually exercise, keep their weight on, in the normal range, and eat a plant-based diet. And not necessarily even vegan, because they didn't measure, they did kind of measure vegans, and they did find that vegans have the lowest BMI, the lowest uh, risk for hypertension and diabetes. But even if you're just vegetarian puts you in a very long living category. <laughs> so the point is most areas with high longevity are at least 90% plant-based. So that's good to know. That's good to know. Good questions. Anyway, thank you so much for those questions. I don't know if you want to do a little, but thank you guys.
thank you. I hope this was informative and uh, helpful. Maybe those people watching will get a benefit too. Hopefully if they'll watch. I mean, it'll be there, right? So you can watch it any anytime you want. Yay. Awesome. Good to see it more than one time. Yeah. Thank you so very much. We do have the ladies made um, fresh fruit bowls. If anybody needs a little something um, before they go home. Sorry. There's fresh fruit in the back, if anybody would like. That's actually a question I'd like you to answer. Can diabetics eat fruit? I love that question. Thank you. I love that question. I just did a video. It's in Spanish, though. You would have to have someone translate it for you. I just put it a video because there was a study that just came out that showed that people who eat a lot of fruit, eating more fruit brings down your risk for diabetes. So that's the latest study that I've seen. Now, I've seen other studies where they took diabetics, put them in two groups, and they gave one group a recommendation of limiting their fruit to two a day, no more. The other group, these are diabetics, the other group were told, eat two or more. So eat more than two a day, hopefully. And so after several months, they found that the group that did not limit their fruit did not have higher sugar in their blood or weight, they didn't increase any weight or have higher blood sugars from eating more fruit. So it didn't affect diabetics to eat more fruit. The third study I wanna mention is one where they actually took people, gave them a piece of bread, white bread, and measured their blood sugar after eating the white bread. And then they gave them white bread and a berry smoothie, basically just blended berries. And you would expect berries have sugar. So if you eat the bread and it increases your blood sugars to here and you add berries, you wouldn't expect blood sugars to be a little bit higher because you have sugar in the bread. But now what happened is instead of the sugar being higher, it was actually lower. So it seemed that the, the berries actually prevented the blood sugars from going up as high as without the berries. So bottom line is no. Eating, definitely eating uh, fruit does not affect diabetics. For the most part, it doesn't. Now, some people tell me, but I know that I eat a banana, it makes, it makes my blood sugar goes up. Yeah, because that person is probably insulin resistant. By changing to a plant-based diet and exercise and change their lifestyle, they can bring down the insulin resistance and then they can eat whenever, any fruit they want. That's my answer to that. Well, we'll be learning more about that in two weeks. Um, we won't be meeting next week, but the week after that on Thursday, we will be meeting. And um, I just want to thank everybody here, and thank you very much. I'm glad that we recorded that because that information is very important to that we could repeat it, you know, just to kind of get that understanding. Um, let's just close with a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful that you have brought us together. We're thankful for um, Maria Jose and her just desire for us to know the human body, how you've created us and how we can be healed by your plan. Thank you for bringing us together and we thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.